all sort of uh, media that involves um, you know, visual, I mean, uh, that involves uh, visual or oral communication is based on some form of storytelling. So photographers are telling stories, still photographers. Performance artists are telling stories. The visual artists are telling stories. Uh, documentary filmmakers are telling stories. Feature filmmakers are telling stories. Painters are telling stories. So no matter what kind of, what, whatever kind of medium you use, if it's a communications medium, if it's me meant to connect with another person, then you are telling the story in some way. So what we're trying to teach you here is some devices for telling stories that are based on some foundations of, of, uh, of what we do. So, so what I've handed out to you is I asked all of you to bring a story that resonates. So I want to give you a couple of minutes just to read very quickly through it. And so there won't be a, a big break on the tape. tape uh, I, I, I also want uh, maybe three people who brought a story with you and who were, uh, maybe more if we, if we have time, because I'd like to do more if we have, to, uh, to, to come to the front and talk about your stories. So, uh, so that we can share with each other. So we can communicate with each other. And one of the things we want to talk about as we go along is how to use these things, but how to, how to, how to uh, use them in their basic forms, but how to turn them into something that you can use. So if, you, if you're a documentary filmmaker, so yes, the inverted pyramid is a, is a tool that you can use to tell a story, but it's a, it's a foundational tool. It's a basic tool that you then build on and figure out, okay, here's something I can use as a foundation for my storytelling, but I then apply my own techniques to it. I apply my own voice to it. And I, I, turn, I take it into something new and something different. That's, that's the creativity you know, and, and the innovation that occurs in terms. So I want to take just a couple of minutes and read through that very quickly. I've known for a long time. He and I were colleagues when I worked for the Associated Press in Washington. Um, I was covering Congress and labor and did some other stuff, and I did the presidential campaign. And Chris covered, uh, covered the White House at that time. And these days, he, uh, he went on to become the assistant chief of bureau for the AP in Washington, and, left, left, and now he does freelance journalism. He teaches, he lectures, he does a lot of things like that, uh, not too different than what I do now. Um, so. Um, so uh, when he found out that I was doing this program, uh, he pointed this story out to me because it was something that he's proud of having done. And so I read through it and I, I thanked him for sending it to me because it really did resonate with me for a couple of reasons. But um, so I, I wanna try to use this story. Uh, and so it did resonate, resonate with me for a number of reasons. First, first of all, I first got introduced to Ethiopian culture when I lived in Washington, DC. So I moved to Washington and I had lived my entire life in the south of the United States. So um, I had lived in Mississippi and Georgia and South Carolina and some other places. And then I moved to Washington, D.C. And suddenly there was this much more diverse culture than I had been used to. And, and where I grew up, there were, there were black people and there were white people pretty much. And there, after, after the Vietnam War uh, along the Mississippi Gulf Coast, they, they, there was became a fairly sizable Vietnam population because they repatriated a lot of 
the Vietnamese refugees to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. A lot of them had been fishermen, and so they brought them to the Mississippi Gulf Coast. But for the most part, when I grew up in Mississippi, and when I lived there as a, as a young adult, it was, it was black and white. And so I moved to Washington, D.C., you know, and, and it, it's this, it's, it's not, Washington, D.C., for those of you who have not been, is the, uh, you probably know, is the capital of the United States. But it, it's, it's not a huge city like, like New York City or Chicago or Los Angeles or Houston, Texas. It's, it's a big city, but it's not a huge city. It's not nearly as big as, big as Addis. So, so it's a big city, but not a huge city. But it is a very culturally diverse city. And I think it's a very beautiful city. Uh, but one of the things I loved about it when I moved there was the cultural diversity. And there was a neighborhood at that time that's mentioned in this story called Adams Morgan, that in, that, in those days was sort of this neighborhood that was up and coming, and largely because a, a number of Ethiopians had moved in there and opened businesses there, and they opened restaurants. So, so, so a friend of mine said, you know, I, we're going to go out for Ethiopian food. And I said, well, I've never had it before. What is it like? And so uh, they took me to the restaurant, and, and I, I kind of got hooked on it. I liked it a lot. And I used to spend some time in Adams Morgan in the neighborhood. But that was my introduction to Ethiopian culture, was through that community who, that lived in, in the United States. And so this, that's why the story resonated with me. So I, I, I say this because, in some ways, pe stories are meant to connect with people. That they're meant to connect with people. So, so when I read this story, it connected me in a way because it took me back to a time and place that really sort of broadened my perspective on the world around me. It introduced me to a culture that was far different than, than any that I had grown up with. So, um, so, so uh, that, that's why I, I like this story. So, so uh, the other thing is um, uh, it, 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 it talks about some things that I've said to you this week, that all stories are about people, so this story is about people, it's about family, it's about culture, it's about food, it's about neighborhoods, it's about businesses, it's about travel, it's about a lot of things that are all packed into this story. And so you see how it, it, so it, this, this, this writer takes all of these things and puts all of those things into to this, this one story. So we talked last night about the inverted pyramid. Does this story follow the inverted pyramid? So one of the things we talked about last night, and I mentioned this last night, and, and to, starting tomorrow, we will begin to get more into this. So this story does not follow the inverted pyramid. It's, it, it has what we talked about, last, I said last night, there's such thing as an anecdotal lead, where we, and, and I'll explain more in more detail, I'll begin tomorrow to explain in more detail what an anecdotal lead is. But this is a feature story. That's one of the reasons I wanted you to see it also. This is, this is a feature story. And because it, it's not about... Uh, an event that's happening. It's not about uh, some, some good or bad thing that's going on in a community. It's not about a news conference. It's not about an accident. It's not about a crime. It's not about a law being passed. It's not about anything except here is this community that this writer found really interesting and decided to, to tell other people about it. And that's a lot of what journalism does. That's what a lot of what feature journalism does, is to find things that resonate with us as storytellers. And so we talked about, so, so some of what's in here about the, the culture itself, except, except he's talking about a population of Ethiopians outside of, outside of Africa and in the United States, but some of what's in here would sound rather mundane to you. So um, you, you said you discovered in Jerob. Uh, I, I discovered it when I lived in Washington, D.C., so, so for you who are Ethiopians, that's a mundane thing. But if you stop and think about it, for many people, it, it, it's not. They don't understand what it is. And if you say in Jera, and he explains what it is, that's what we do. That's what it's journalists we do. We take the mundane, we take the ordinary, and make it interesting to other people. We, that's one of the things we talked about already, is how do we take what's, what seems commonplace and everyday to us and turn it into something that's special for other people. So for me, this story, this, this, is, a, this is a story that sort of sets a, a time and a place and talks about a group of people and a culture. It talks about a lot of things in ways that sort of packs a lot of information in. So the people who didn't know much about, uh, about Ethiopian culture, certainly in the, the Ethiopian diaspora in the United States, certainly, would, would learn quite a bit about it from this story. And then, hopefully, their interest would be piqued to learn more about it, okay? So it does not follow the, the inverted pyramid. And this is one of the, so, so I talked about last night about 
about the anecdotal lead. This uses an anecdotal, an anecdotal lead. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that now because I'm going to bring you an example of it tomorrow in which we go into uh, uh, more detail. But, but here's, here's the other thing we, that we talked about. Storytelling is the foundation of all journalism. And that, that's what he does, right? He tells you a story, right? Storytelling is the foundation of all journalism. So good writing is fundamental to all non-visual storytelling. So the idea is that the story needs to be easy to read, and hopefully you found this story easy to read. All journalism is about people. And that's what this story is about. It talks about food, it talks about culture, it talks about shops and restaurants and, and travel and all those things, but it's about people. That's what the story is about. So I want to dig into just a little bit more and then we'll, we'll start to talk about your stories. So I said the story does not follow the inverted pyramid, but we did talk about stories with the who, what, when, where, why, how. So what's the who in this story? The answer was, for those who didn't hear it very well, the Ethiopian di diaspora. So, so lots of times we think if we need to answer the question, who is the story about? We think in terms of individuals, and that is not always the case. The who can be uh, a, a couple, it could be a group of people, it can be an organization, but it, 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 the who is people. And so the who in this story is the Ethiopian diaspora in, in Washington, D.C., in, in Washington, D.C. area. What, what, tell, what's the what in this story? How do they, how do they live? The number of Ethiopians living in Washington, D.C. is increasing, and it has been for some time now. What else? They, they run businesses, they own businesses. So, so, that, so, so that, there are all those things that come in, so, so, uh, it, and it, it doesn't necessarily, the what doesn't necessarily jump out as the, as, as the first thing that you see, right? But it's in there. If you start to look, you, you, so that's the who, that's the what. What's the when? It's the, the time element is now. It's, it's a contemporary story. So he doesn't state that emphatically. And so, so this is one of the things about journalism. As much of what we write, when we, particularly when we start to write features, is implied. And that is a storytelling technique. It's implied. Now he, starts to, he does talk about the, the point at which the, the, the Ethiopian population in the Washington, D.C. area started to grow. But the time element in this story is contemporary. It's a story about now. Okay? So that's the who, the what, the when, where. So, so that's pretty obvious. It's about Washington, D.C. But the other thing that he does, he goes in and he starts to talk about neighborhoods. You know, he, the, uh, uh, he talks about the historically African-American Shaw neighborhood, uh, which, by the way, is not so African-American anymore. Um, he talks about, he, I think somewhere he talks about the Adams Morgan neighborhood. He talks about um, a neighborhood in Virginia. So, so he sets a time and he sets a he sets a time and then he sets a place and he takes us to different places around Washington D.C. So, so the, the 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 core area that he's talking about is Washington D.C. But he also sets a scene that's a little bit better for us where he talks about uh, about um, particular neighborhoods in which in which people live, who, what, when, where, why. Why? What's the purpose of this story? What, what is he trying to tell readers? And this is important in feature writing. What, what is he trying to tell readers? Some, some people left for political reasons. They stayed and they've grown families there. They've grown businesses. They've grown communities. But there's, there's, there's something that's particular about feature. Why do we write feature stories at all? You know, it's, it's, it tends to, from a story like this is, is a pure feature. It's just, it's, it's just about sort of a snapshot of something that's going on somewhere in the world. So if, if you write a story like this, what's the purpose of writing it? Every story has to have a why. The story is for the feeling center of the kids in the school. These kids not, don't have lunch and breakfast every day. So some, uh, some, some of the societies are contributing in the moon and uh, feeling this case. This case, before this contribution, they, they collapse, they fell down, and they, they don't understand, they don't follow their class attentively. Uh, 
this is the, the story. And there are 120 trainers feeding on daily basis. Uh, this this uh, school is around Piazza. The name is Brad Junior Elementary School. So these kids are supported by some societies. One of the supporters is the first league, Roma. And now they are feeling by their uh, the association and the contributors. But that I missed, if the kids are coming to feed, uh, eat to the, their lunch, they have to bring their lunch box because they don't feel apart from those guys bring their food from their home. So they, they bring their empty lunch box and the center put the food in the, their lunch box and they go and eat with their friends that uh, which uh, come bring their food from their home. So they don't feel apart, they don't feel, they, they don't think psychologically affected. That's the story I impressed. What's the who in this story? And for those of you who followed him along, what's the who in this story? It's the children. It's the children. It's this group of children. So, so, so he's writing about this group of children that, that don't have lunch. So what's the what? He's writing a, a script for, for a documentary about, about children who go to, uh, it's a daycare center, right? Or a, a school, okay. who go to school. And, and so, so the who is the kids? So he told us about the setting and about the scene. So what is the what in this story? A shortage of food. There are kids in this school who, who, who were going hungry. Lunchtime is, yeah, at lunchtime, they were going hungry at lunchtime, but, but he said yeah. breakfast and lunch. But the broader element in this story, what's the broader element, the broader time element of the story? It's a contemporary story. It's a now story. Much the way the story about Washington, D.C. is. This is a now story. And so, so sometimes when we think in terms of time elements in stories, the time element can be it happened yesterday at 5 o'clock, or the time element can be that it happened in a period of time, or, or when we write about these sort of contemporary issues, particularly in feature stories, and, and this, the, the feature writing is the basis of documentary film and feature films and things like that. So when you're writing, when you're writing for that, the time element is going to be a bit broader. And, and, and very often, particularly in documentary filmmaking, we're going to write about, you, you're going to write about things that are contemporary issues. They are now issues. So that's the time element of the story. So there is a specific, uh, there, there's a, a specific issue about breakfast and lunch, which is a time of day, which refers to the time of day. But in, in the broader sense, in the, the, the real sense that the time element of the story is, an, is a contemporary story, it's a now story. So that's the who, what, when. What about the where? Where is, where is the school? Um, yes. Okay. So that's, that's the where at the school. And so, so, so that, this is what we look for. So when you start to tell us, so, so where, uh, why? Because he talks about, I, I believe you said that children don't perform well in school when they don't, when they don't eat. So the, the idea, so the, the why is to demonstrate this so that the children can do better in school. And, and, and the how. What was the how here? He had that in there. Did, did, did the kids eat by 15, one five per, per day? Look, we are telling around our office somewhere. We, we spent this money, but they live the whole day by this money. So th that, that was the interesting part of the story, because we spent a lot of money somewhere we are recreating. And, and one of the things that struck me about the story is you said the, ki the, the kids who don't have, they, br they bring the lunch to school, right? So the kids who don't have it bring an empty bucket. Yeah. And, and, and they put food in the empty bucket so they, could, they can, they can go sit with their friends and, and have lunch or oh, breakfast. So this, these are the kinds of details that when you're thinking about writing, feature writing, that you need to bring into a story. You know, so because, so, so if you see when we start to tell these stories, so while this is, this is not going to be, an, this is not, never going to be an inverted pyramid story, but, but fe and feature writing usually is not, but it is going to tell us this narrative about this group of children who go to school every day and who can't afford any lunch. So they would go hungry otherwise, except they, they, there are people who, who are raising money for them so that they can bring an empty bucket. 
And, and frankly, that kind of strikes me as this whole idea that them bringing an empty bucket. So, and, 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 and pieces of a story like that would resonate with everybody. And so, so that's what you're looking for in this, in the, when you, what, what resonates with people. So, so, so why would he tell this story? What, what's the importance of this story to any of you or any of us? The simplest thing in my life or our life is a big life for the others. Mm -hmm. That's why if, if I have to control it for this, I have to, I have to be responsible for this case. So I have to donate, I have to purchase, therefore I have to buy. That's, that's why to aware the society how to support these kids because we don't know how to support these people. That's why I think these kids are hungry. Yeah, and this is the thing about being a storyteller. When when you are the storyteller, when you and, and whether you're covering breaking news or you're writing a feature story, whether you're actually writing a writing a feature story that's going to be published on, on in a in a in a written publication or online, or you're writing a script for a film. You have to be touched by the story that you tell them. You know, so, so yesterday, and we'll do a little bit more with that story. So yesterday we did this little thing about the woman being mugged on the street. You have to care about that. If, if you didn't care that some elderly woman got mugged on the streets, there's no reason to write a story about it. If we didn't care that people lost their lives when a mine caved in or when a, 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 a hurricane or a typhoon hit the shore of some country, you know, it, we write these stories because we care about them. Because there's something about them that touches us. And so, so any time that you are going to write a story, this is, this is part of you know, the, whole, the, the whole, whole concept of finding the focus of your story. You find the focus of your story because it's in here. It's inside of you. So if you believe, as I believe, and, and, and apparently you believe, that those, you know, so, so I grew up Baptist in a Christian denomination. And, you know, and one of, the, one of the, my fundamental beliefs is for those who are, of us who are given much, much is also required of us. So it's difficult for me to pass by and, on a daily basis and see people and think they're going hungry, hungry and I'm eating and, and me not share in some way. Maybe not every time I pass by them on the streets, but in some way share with those people. So, so, so something about that story has to resonate inside you. Something has to be drawn out of you. Something has to be touched in you. And the way that he stands and talks with this story of, with, with a kind of emotion that will show up in his script and ultimately in his film. You, it is, it, and this is, this is the place where we have to be very careful about journals because you are the storyteller. You are not the story. And so you walk into a place and you have empathy for people. You know, but, but, it's, it's, but, but you cannot overdo it in telling a story. You know, because, because you, you, you know, there's, you know, there, there are often times that we go into situations where we feel a sense of guilt about what's going on, you know, either whatever kind of situation it happens to be. But if you were going in and covering a natural disaster, you know, you, you really do have to be, and I've done this sort of thing. You go in, you cover a natural disaster. You go in, you cover a setting where, a scene where someone has been killed. You go in, you cover something where, where children are hungry or whatever it happens to be. You have to, in many ways, However you are touched by that story, as the storyteller, you, you want the empathy to come into, be, be, to be felt by other people, but you have to be dispassionate in a way in your approach to gathering information about that story. One of the things as, as storytellers, as journalists, that we always, well, that we're, we always have to do is, is talk to other people about the work that we do. You know, uh, it's one of the reasons we, it's one of the reasons that editors exist, you know, uh, because I've, I've, as a reporter, I've, I've done it. As an editor, I've had reporters do it. Where I've said to people, "You are too close to this story. You're too close to the story." Um, when when Hurricane when Hurricane um, uh, Katrina when Hurricane Katrina I'm sorry when Hurricane Katrina hit the Gulf Coast and it destroyed the city of New Orleans, the great city of New Orleans. It, it, it now now here's the thing. So so New Orleans. New Orleans is on, is, on, is, is on the Gulf Coast where the Mississippi River empties into the Gulf of Mexico. There sits the, the, the city of New Orleans, and it is below sea level. So it's surrounded by a series of levees, and they have these giant pumps, and when it rains hard in New Orleans, they pump the water out. So, so New Orleans has, on the north side, it has Lake Pontchartrain, a big lake. And then to the south of it, it has the Gulf of Mexico, and then forming a, a crescent on well, most things, is the Mississippi River. So surrounded by all this water. And then the bayou's off to the west. So, so it, the city itself sits below sea level. There's only one part of it that's actually above sea level. And, and, 
and is protected by those pumps and by levees. So after Hurricane Katrina, the levees broke and the city of New Orleans was destroyed by, by flooding. So, so I say this, so how do you know? So, we, so uh, the Associated Press had uh, one of its primary bureaus in New Orleans. And, and obviously it's a big story, so you send other people in. But, in. but some of the people who lived there had to be taken off the stories because they're too close to the story. There's no way that you, you know, you, not, now fortunately for our, for our people, no one's home got destroyed or anything like that. But you live in a city, you, you love this place, you love the people, you love the culture, and it's, you cannot walk around without, without being overcome with emotion about it. When you are at that point where you are seeing something that you are trying to cover, that you are so overcome with emotion that you can't, you can't report you, with some level of objectivity on it, with some level of dispassion about it, then you are too close to the story. Now, and I'll tell you a little bit of story about myself. Um, I, I, I started my career as a journalist um, working for my hometown newspaper. I grew up in Meridian, Mississippi, which is a small town in the South. I, I, uh, the, on the, 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 the American Independence Day is the 4th of July. So 4th of July is a big holiday in the United States and everybody's off work and you know, everything's closed. But the, the night before the 4th of July, there was a traffic accident. And I was sent out with a, a photographer to cover the traffic accident. I was a young reporter right out of college. So we go out to cover this traffic accident, and a driver had been driving up this, up this road at a very, very high rate of speed. And so he gets to this curve, the road curved around. So he gets to the curve, he's on the wrong side of the road. And there's this couple who used to, so who, used, who would carry children around on a, on a pickup truck to baseball, to the baseball games, if, if you know what American baseball is. So, so there was this married couple and a group of kids. There was, there was one child sitting in the front with them, and there was, so that's four people. So there were six people, there were six on the back of the truck. There were 10 people total. He comes around the curve, he hits them head on. He kills himself. He kills the husband and the wife and the child in the front seat of the car. And all the kids on the back of the, 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 the truck are thrown off. And, and so I was there covering this, and there was this, all these dead people lying there. And this, this woman started walking up the street, up the road, and she saw this child that was lying dead on the side of the road, and it was her child. And, and of course, she was overcome with grief, and, and after that, I could never cover another traffic accident because I couldn't, I, 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 I couldn't see that kind of thing happening to other human beings and not be personally affected by it in a way that I could cover it very well. So I never covered another traffic accident. In my entire career, I never covered another traffic accident. So that's how, that's how you know. It's when you get so personally involved in a story. Even if it's, even if it's a story like this where it's, it's not a tragedy in the sense that people are losing their lives, but something bad is happening or where there's a loss of property or homes or you know, natural death that you, you have to maintain some level of distance from the story or else you cannot be an effective storyteller. Exactly. Every, every story comes out of our curiosity. Even reporters who cover politics and government, are, you know, and I was a primarily a government and politics reporter. I grew up really curious and interested in politics and government, so that's why I became one. That's what we, re that's what we write about. That's what we make films about, is things that we care about, things that we are interested in, and that's, that's why we're good at it, is because we care about them. But, so, but you, 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 you have to condition yourself that in order, so, so you know, one of the things um, I, I said, we, Monday we talked, we said, talk, I, the, this whole thing about all, telling all sides of a story, the only way you can tell all sides of a story is that you maintain a level of distance from the story. So you do care, you're curious about the story, and you do care about the story. That's why, that's why there are reporters who cover those kinds of stories, who make films about those kinds of stories. They're, that's why people cover, you know, um, health care or crime or anything like that, or, or weather, because they care and because they're curious about it. But, but, but at the same time, you, 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 you use that curiosity, you use that passion that you feel for a subject, to let it, to let it, let you dig into a subject, but you have to be conscious enough, and, and this is the thing, you have to be conscious enough of your own emotions about the story 
to know when you're getting too close to the story. And that's one of the things that as journalists we always have to do is be conscious of your own emotions. So that you, if you know you're getting too, too close, too close to the story, that is very good. Thank you very much. So because what I wanted to talk about is finding the focus of your story. And the real question for you is how do I find the focus of my story? So you have found something you're interested in, you know, whatever it happens to be. And then there's the question of how do I create a story out of it? You know, so, so uh, the, the example that I gave you um, of the story that Chris Connell wrote about the Ethiopian diaspora in Washington just kind of grew out of his curiosity. He's, he's been seeing these people for years. And he finally thought, I, sh I, sh I should tell other people about this community of people. Because, you know, um, he, he sort of has interacted with them a lot. And he's gotten to know some people and feels like, you know, I should, tell, I, should, I should tell this story. So the question then becomes, how do I find the focus of my story? And so we, we start to, we don't always know that when we start to work on a story. And one of the things I think journalists and, and filmmakers sometimes make a mistake about is that we think because I have an idea that it must ultimately end up in some, a finished project. And that is not the case. There have been many times um, that, that you start a project as a, as, as a reporter, if you're a print journalist, if you're a writer, that you start a project because I, I'm interested in it, particularly when you're doing feature work, or even if you're following up on something, and these would be feature stories, by the way, if you, if you take something that was a tragedy and you start following up on it, because you were trying to find out the why. What happened? Why did it happen? You know, how do I tell this story to people that it connects with them? And, and, and one of the questions that someone asked me earlier is, is that, you know, that sometimes when these kinds of things happen, communities really sort of dwell on it, you know. They, they dwell on the tragedy itself, you know, Facebook pages crop up, you know, and all these things, and, and we, we mourn the people, and then it just sort of goes away. It, it just goes away. And the question beyond that is that you as a storyteller be, becomes, you know, how do I not simply dwell on a tragedy, but how do I make something out of this? So if, if, if a young woman has lost her life here, and, and one of the things the young woman who, who was asking me about and talking with me about this over the break talked about is one of the things she cares about as a journalist is emp empowerment of women. Now, now, let me say this, you know, uh, one of the things I talked about early on Monday, I believe, was I said that, uh, you know, as I expect journalists to be fair. There has always been in Western journalism, this notion that journalists have to be completely impartial, they have to be completely objective. And, and I, I won't say that you should not strive for that. But what I also say is that every journalist becomes a journalist. Every filmmaker becomes a filmmaker because they want to tell stories. And there are particular stories that resonate with them in some way. There are stories they connect with, okay? They're stories that you feel impacted by. So at the point in my life where I wanted to become a journalist, you know, I as I told you, there was the civil rights movement in the United States, there was the Vietnam War, and there was the resignation of President Richard Nixon in a big scandal. So I wanted to tell stories, and I wanted to tell stories primarily about those kinds of things. So ultimately, it led, to me, to, it led me to being a political journalist. I covered primarily, from, for most of the years that I was a writer, I covered, at some level or, or another, I covered po primarily politics and government. So I was a political reporter. And when I went to Washington, I covered politics and government. When I was a local reporter in a city, I covered politics and government. When I worked for the Associated Press covering uh, at a state level, I covered politics and government. But it's something I was interested in. And, and I thought, Here's a way that I can tell stories that affect people's lives in some way. So part of it for me was when I was growing up, the journalists who would come into the South to talk about the civil rights struggle, and, and they, they, they did a good job, but they were largely white. There, there were no black journalists coming in to tell those stories. And I thought to myself, why can't we tell our own stories? Why can't we tell our own stories? And I think that's part of the question that, 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 that uh, we're, we're addressing here is,
Why can't you tell your own stories? Why do journalists from, from the United States and Canada and Britain and France and Australia and all these other places in Germany, why do they have to come in and tell your stories? Why can't you tell your stories? So, so you have this idea, you see something that happens, you feel impacted by it. And you think, I want to, I want to tell that story in some way. So then that becomes the question of, of how do I find the focus of my story? So there are all these things that all these people have talked about. You know, so, so you're out somewhere and you, you know, and these, this is how you, know, you talk about making the mundane <coughs> interesting to people. You're out on the streets and, and you're seeing all these people. And they're just people. And, and people are trying to get from one place to another. And you're thinking, where are all the taxis and their buses are crowded or whatever? You know, these are the kinds of things you see every day. You know, and, 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 and I, I see it in New York City. Everybody's, and if you ever come to New York City, you will see it. At, at, at between five and six o'clock, everybody is in a hurry. Everybody's in a hurry. So, so that's, that's part of the culture. But it's an everyday thing there. But no, but, but, but what if I noticed it with a fresh view and then I decided I wanted to write about it? So the question then becomes, how do I find the focus of my story? So what are they rushing towards? You know, what's the sense of urgency? You know, why is everybody in such a hurry? You know, so, so um, and, and I actually asked that question when I first moved to New York, you know, and, uh, and someone said to me, you know, well, they've got trains to catch and they're on, the trains are sometimes on a schedule and they've got buses to catch and things like that and they need to get there. So they're in a hurry to get there. And, and so, so that's it. So, but you end up with stories about this one, like, like the, the, the children who were going hungry at a school. And you were struck by that, but these are the kinds of stories that draw us into things. The story about the, the young woman who was killed by the police officer. We, 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 are, we are drawn towards stories that connect with us personally. But at some point, you have to be a dispassionate observer. You have to care about the story. But it is not your story to tell. We are storytellers, but we tell other people's stories. We are not telling those stories for ourselves, we're telling them for other people. So, so we're, the, we're, to, we're the middle person, we're the intermediary here. We're in the middle. So we've got, we've got the person who's own, who owns this story, and we've got the people that we believe ought to hear this story. And so we're the storyteller. And we're just, we're just the intermediary here, so that we become the person who, who, who uh, decides, what do they get to know about this? And as I said, all stories are about, ultimately about people. How do, what, do, what, do we, what, do, what do they need to know? What, how, how is it going to impact them? And I think that's one of the things that, that goes back to this question of how do you allow yourself not to become too connected to a story? Because when you were, when you were so emotionally connected to a particular story, you cannot effectively tell that story. You, you simply cannot. Um, I, I knew a young reporter, actually he's still, he's still a uh, reporter, he, he's, he's now probably 10 years out of college, so he's still young, but, but he, 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 uh, he was an intern for us right out of college. And he liked writing about music. And we had him doing some other things, um, but he loved writing about music. And so the editor in the office where he worked gave him some assignments to write about music. And she said the worst stuff that he wrote but his worst journalism was about music, which is, which is the thing he loved the most. So why is that? Because he's too close to it. Because he's thinking about the music as a musician. He, and, he turned, and he was a musician. But he's thinking about a musician as a musician, not as an observer. And I think that's one of the things that we always have to realize as storytellers. We are observers. The stories don't belong to us. We are telling other people's stories to, uh, to someone that we believe needs to hear that story. Now, it's up to us to decide what facts we want to talk about. You know, what do we want to put into place? So, so we, we talk about finding the focus of a story. So, so we've got this. Let's go back to the story about the, 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 the hungry kids. So there are all these elements of this story. 
where you know we've got we've got hungry children, we've got a school, we've got issues about whether children can learn when they're hungry. We, you know why why are they coming to, to work? It's issues of poverty, um, uh, issues of family life. Um, are who's coming to their rescue? You know things like that, and so. So, um, I, and I really was struck by this, this, this question. I asked myself the question. And so all the things that we, we, we talk about, the whole who, what, when, where, why, how, they're questions that you need to answer in your story. But, that, but to, the, to the extent that you can, you should start off by asking yourself those questions. And if you cannot begin to piece together a narrative before you actually begin your reporting, or then, then it's pop, you're probably not going to be able to put together a really, a really good story. Now, here's the thing. You will start at one place, and ultimately you may end up someplace completely different. Because there's a saying that we have in, in American journalism is that we follow the reporting. Anybody know what that means? Somebody just take a guess. What, is, what, what does it mean to follow the reporting? Yeah, what, what, if I say, as a journalist, I follow the reporting. Somebody just, and you take a while, guess. What does it mean? Don't, don't, don't put your opinion. Right. It's not your opinion. You, exactly. What else? Follow the natural story of the report. So, don't, you, don't, you, don't, yeah, don't you don't need to, there, you, when you start investigating, and, and every story has some level of investigating, there are facts that you will find out. So, so, so you started with an idea in your head, you know? And, and this is what I want to write. I want to write a story about whatever it happens to be. So you start with this idea in your head. So following the reporting means that when you start to learn facts about that story, that you're reporting when you, about the subject that you're writing or, or reporting about, when you, as you learn facts, then your ultimate story is based on the facts that you were able to find and not the premise with which you originally started. And, and there are too many journalists who do that. And one of the things, and, and who, who, who was it talking about? You talking about the lies? Who was it talking about the lies? Yeah, Monday night. That's, that's the thing. Is because journalists begin reporting a story with the premise in their minds. And they basically try to build the case for the premise that they started with. And that is how stories that are distorted, that are factually incorrect, that, that sometimes are, are factually correct but still paint an inaccurate picture of something, you know, um, actually get, get into, into publication. Because I have this idea in my mind that Ethiopia is a place like this. This is what it looks like. This is what the people are like. And so I go to that place with this story in my mind, and I'm going to come away with that story no matter what. Following the reporting means that when I get on the ground in whatever place I happen to be, that if the facts that I find differ from what my original premise was, what my original belief was, that I follow the facts, not my premise. Because that's what, the, and, and even, if you, even if you were doing sort of opinion journalism, um, 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 uh, commentary, things like that, you, it has to be based on facts. So, so you start with, your, with asking yourself a question, you know, and, and you come up with this idea, so you, but you find the focus of your story by digging, by uncovering things, by allowing yourself to follow the reporting, by focusing on the facts and not on your premise itself. So I, I want to a answer any questions that you might have. And, and, and a number of you have, have asked me questions at the break, um, and some of them were very good, and some of them I actually wouldn't mind sharing with, with, with the rest of the group. Um, um, and and one, one in particular was about how to take a story that, that sort of paints a community in a bad light and, and sort of pitch it forward, look forward. And because, because, you know, sometimes as journalists, you, you kind of get, and, and one, one of the things I said to her was that for as long as I've been a journalist, um, I got into journalism in 1978, 30, 37 years ago. And for all this time, people have said, you know, journalists only re report about bad things. 
You know, and, and, and it seems to never matter what you report about. People have this idea that journalists only report about bad things. And I posted a story to Facebook today that talks about how American, the, um, how the, the American public um, distrusts the news media. And it wasn't, it wasn't the, the complete focus of the story, but it was one of the facts in the story. That, and so Americans tend to listen to news media that they report about things that they want to hear, that, that sort of focus on their points of view, and, and everything else is bad. So, so, um, but if, so, so that's part of the challenge that you will always be up against, is that people will always be, have some level of suspicion of you as a journalist. But you have to know within your own heart that what you are trying to do is tell facts. So your goal is not to betray a community in a bad light, but it is to, to sort of tell things as they are. So when you have a tragedy, so how do you not dwell on that? How do you, how do you make something of it? So there are all kinds of ways to do that. Is, is by, particularly, you know, and she was talking about empowering women, how do, how do, we, how do we write stories that tell women how do I let myself not become a victim anymore? And sometimes it's easier said than done, both in terms of the reporting and in terms of what, you know, the solutions that you might look to come up with. But, but, but sort of look, look for ways, you know, I talk, one of the things we talked about, uh, what is news? One of, the, one of the elements of it is it's helpful. So how do we help people be, be, do something that they don't know how to do now? How do we help people empower themselves? so that I don't become a victim of, of, of a street corner crime or, or, or that, that my community is better or, or how do I tell people how to organize uh, uh, themselves so that they can look out for, for, for suspicious activity in their communities, things like that. Oh, and one, one other question, and I, I will actually get into this more over the next couple of days, um, one of the things somebody, somebody just asked me when you, when you, he said, he said, what would the headline of that story be? And, and very often when we're journalists, particularly if, we, if, we're, if we're print journalists, if we write for newspapers or online, and I, and I call online print journalism, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're writers, we tend to think, well, I'll, I'll get to the headline afterwards. But sometimes you have difficulty when you've been out, on, when you've been out reporting. So you've been following the facts, right? You've been following the reporting, and you've got a notebook full of notes, and, and you've got all these things running around in your head. And so that question is a very good one. You start to ask you, what would be the headline of that story? And from that, you can really start to, that, now, it, it may not ultimately be the headline of the story, but it does help you start to focus your thinking. Because one of the things that you will find difficult to do is when you have gathered lots and lots of information, so the, the hardest stories of the right, uh, right, the hardest stories to write are the ones that have too little information and the ones that have too much information. And the ones that have too much information sometimes can be more difficult to write because if you have too little, you know, maybe you can put, you can stop and you can go search for more. But when you have too much, sometimes it, you just, you weight it down by the burden of knowing too much. Okay, so, and then I, I really do, and I've said this a couple of times now, but I really do want to say, you know, you have to know when you're too close to a story. You have to know when to walk away from it. You have to know to, when, when uh, and, and one of the things, the, in, uh, um, and, and I, I cannot tell you that journalists always practice it, but, uh, but the, there's an organization in the United States called the Society of, of Professional Journalists. A lot of American Canadian journalists are members of it. And, and they have uh, a code of ethics that basically tells us, um, you know, not when we should be involved. If, if things, if they're personal things, conflicts of interest, if, for instance, if you write about, if you, uh, if you write about this, uh, the stock market, you can't write about stocks that you own. If you, if you are write about crime, you can't write a story about a, a family member. Um, you, things like that. You know, so, so that you can keep an arm, a distance, keep a distance from the journals that you're writing about so that you can be that dispassionate observer that I talked about. And so that you can make sure that your reporting includes all sides, not just both sides, but all sides of a story. Sometimes that is, that is the case where, where you have done all the digging, you've asked all the questions, you still can't find any focus for your story. You know, so, so um, 
one of the things we always have to think about, um, and there's this sort of saying in, in the United States, there's no there there. And what it means is, is that we've decided that, that, uh, that, that we, we're focused on something, but there's not really anything there. And, and so that's this other ad thing about, about his question earlier about, I, 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 I can get something in my mind and be pretty dogged about it. I can, I can latch on to it and I can think I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go for it because I know that there, sometimes there's, no, there's nothing there. Now, there can be sometimes, there are other things that can happen. Sometimes when you have done a, you've, you've been out and you've been reporting on a story and gathering information and interviewing people, that it can be either of two things, or either of several things actually. One, you cannot have enough information. Uh, two, you can have too much information. And three, you cannot have the right information. So if you, have, if you have been out reporting a story and you think, I've got all of, all of this and I still cannot find the focus of my story, it's probably one of those three things. Either you have not enough, you have too much, or you don't have the right information. Very often, it's that you don't have the right information. And that's, that goes back to one of the things we talked about earlier. One of, the, one of the things that we bring to this process is our natural curiosity. So you have to make sure that you are asking the right questions. And, and if, you, if you've been out reporting and you think, I, I'm, I've got all of this and I still can't find the focus of my story. Now, so, so what I would suggest if you, if you run into that, that one of the, and, and, and it's something that I certainly have done before because I've had that happen. Where I've been out, I've been out reporting a story and I think, I, I, just, I, can't, I can't figure it out. Um, the first thing, and one of the things I said uh, is, is try saying, of everything that I have, what, what headline would jump out at me? How would I headline this story? And so that gives you something to latch onto. The other thing is, is to sit down with somebody you know, maybe an editor or a colleague or someone that you know and whose judgment you trust and start to talk about the facts that you have and, and see if they can help you find the focus. Because that's, that's one of the things a good editor can help you do. Is, is, and if you are an editor, it's one of your, your roles as an editor is to help your reporters find the focus of their stories because they will not always. And sometimes it does, it does not mean they have not done a good job. Sometimes they have done a very good job, but, but you know, it's, it's, the, it's this thing of being immersed into a story. You've gotten so much that you've almost become a part of the story and you just kind of, you know, there's this whirlwind of information going around, you, you know, and you have all this stuff. Sometimes you, sometimes you haven't asked the right questions. Sometimes you haven't gathered the right information. But much of the time, you've done it right, but you still can't figure it out. So that's the role of a good editor, is to go through with you to say, to start asking you questions about what you have. And if you don't have that, talk to a trusted colleague who can sort of draw out of you what it is that you have found out so that perhaps they can help you find the focus of your story. And if, if, if someone who, who is good at that sort of thing can't help you find the focus of your story, then you probably are not there yet. And you need to do some more reporting. Does that answer your question? Okay. Well, I'm, that's going to be it for tonight. Uh, I want to. Uh, I'm going to change course a little bit. So, um, so uh, I think it's important to sort of understand this whole concept of finding the focus of the story. But tomorrow we're going to. We're actually going to get it more into the, the nuts and bolts of writing the leads for your story and actually putting the story together. So, so that's what we're going to start on tomorrow night. Uh, I, I appreciate your attention tonight. You, you are a really good class, and I, I'm, I'm enjoying this a lot. So thank you very much.